Hey guys, um, today we're going to talk about the Tsars of Russia, specifically Peter the Great. Uh, you can see this is the family crest of the Romanovs, uh, the ruling dynasty of Russia from about 1615 all the way till 1918, really 1917, when the Bolsheviks overthrew um, the Romanov family and ultimately had them executed. Uh, the story of absolutism in Russia really gets started with with a discussion of the Mongolian Golden Horde. If you'll recall, the Mongols established this huge land empire uh, starting in about 1240 in Russia. They called their Khanate the Golden Horde Khanate. And as you can see on this map, it's quite extensive. It's stretched from the shore of the Black Sea, the Caspian, and beyond. Uh, basically all the way to basically Mongolia and then into the north up through the, up to through the Ural Mountains encompassing much of European Russia. Uh, it was a very decentralized government. The Mongols really weren't interested in day-to-day -day governance. What they were interested in is collecting tax, taxes and tribute, collecting money, extracting wealth from the Russian people. Uh, the native Russians were ruled in the name of the Khan, and uh, this rule really isolated Russia from all the changes happening in um, Europe. In Europe, uh, during this time, we're seeing the end of the uh, feudalism as uh, the Black Death sweeps across Europe. Well, the Black Death really doesn't make its way into Russia. So Russia's saved from that horrible affliction. But that means a lot of medieval practices continue in Russia that had otherwise died out in the rest of Europe. Uh, the princes of Muscovy, one of the cities, one of the states, city-states, uh, centered on Moscow, become one of the most powerful Russian princes, mainly because they cooperate with the Mo with the Mongols, they become the Mongols' tax collectors. Um, now you have the rulers, the princely class, uh, the czars, if you will, who are the people who will become czars. And then you have the boyars, these landed nobility, uh, much like the dukes and earls and barons of Europe. The boyar are the nobility that serve to challenge the rule of the. Uh, princes of Mus of Muscovy. Now, of course, we're ignoring, up to this point, we've ignored 99.9% .9 of the population who are serfs. The peasantry, the serfs of Russia, deserve mention here as well. They were, up until about 1450, uh, free peasants. Uh, they worked the land, and if they wanted to move, they could. If they thought they would get a better shake with a different landlord or landowner, they could move. Uh, there was so much land in Russia that the serfs really didn't stick around anyway. They'd work a plot of land, develop it, farm it until it was exhausted, and then move on to a new plot of land somewhere else. Well, what happens as the nobility become more interested in collecting taxes and, of course, getting wealthy, Likewise, monasteries of the Eastern Orthodox Church begin establishing themselves and wanting to generate some wealth. They begin restricting the movement rights of the peasantry through taxation. What they basically did was they would prohibit peasants from leaving the land until all their taxes were paid. And of course, they never caught up on their taxes. The taxes were so heavy and so onerous that these peasants were trapped on the lands. This idea that the monasteries had come up with, trapping peasants on the land through taxes, uh, was extended basically to all peasants by 1497. These are referred to as forbidden years, or in the next really offensive things are referred to as forbidden years. These were prohibitions against peasants from moving around Russia from changing landlords to moving to a new plot of land. It's the essential insurfment of the peasantry. Well, 
the forbidden years were only one year long. You, the czar would issue a forbidden year, which prohibited movement from one land to another for one calendar year. Well, then they became more frequent until they just got renewed every year and peasants were enserfed, essentially slaves, maybe one step above slaves. That continued until 1906. Wrap your brain around that. Serfdom continued in Russia. Even after it had died out already in Europe, pretty much at this time, or shortly after the Black Death, so call that 1350 to 1400, the, the serfdom had died out in Western Europe by 1400 latest. It continued until 1906 in Russia. It's crazy. Okay, so Peter the Great uh, is the czar, who, the ruler of Russia, who drags Russia kicking and screaming into the modern era. Uh, he was everything you could want in a ruler. Peter the Great, as a young, as a child, was brilliant. He was so smart and engaging and a character. He had a lot of personality. His brother was sickly. He was, he wasn't particularly intelligent. He was always sick. And, but he was older. He was a little bit older than, uh, than Peter. Well, they become Kozar when their older brother, Fyodor, dies in 1682. Fyodor also had a lot of health issues. Well, they're underage, Peter and his brother Ivan, and so their sister, Sophia, takes over. She's older in her majority, and she also attempts to kill them both. So their mother takes Peter and Ivan and hides them in a village so they can grow up more or less free from, you know, their crazy sister who was trying to kill them. In 1689, during a revolt of the palace guard, Peter and their mother, and Ivan, who was along for the ride, uh, wrestle control of the state from Sophia. Of course, Peter's 17 at this point, <laughs> and Mom steps in as regent and basically tries to keep him off to the side. Uh, well, Mom dies in 1694, and Peter and his brother rule. Now, most Russian historians tend to agree that even though Ivan was pretty sickly, even as an adult, Peter might have helped his brother along uh, towards death in 1696. Um there's a lot of power involved here. With the death of Ivan, however, Peter becomes the sole czar of Russia. So Russia, as compared to Europe in 1700, has the this huge stone weight around its neck of serfdom. Serfdom ties the peasants to the land, as we discussed just a minute ago. By contrast, what's happening in Europe? the rise of a middle class. By 1700, we're talking about a time period where the Enlightenment is in full swing. New ideas, there's scientific revolution is kicking in, but in Russia, it's still a medieval mess. Uh, Russia's isolated. And I can't stress this point enough. Russia's isolation was almost complete. Religion isolated Russia. Russia's Eastern Orthodox, by this time Russian Orthodox, they have their own patriarch in the uh, city of Moscow. And again, this religion orients them to Moscow rather than Rome. Uh, the isolation of the Mongols, this this golden horde that kept merchants out of Russia for hundreds of years while the Mongols ruled Russia, isolated Russia from the Renaissance, from the Age of Exploration, from the Enlightenment. 
And of course, geography isolated Russia. Russia's massive. It is a huge country. It's what, seven or eight time zones? It's huge. The sheer size of the country beggars the imagination. And quite frankly, they had no warm water ports. There were no ports in Russia that remained ice free 12 months of the year. What this means is that trade couldn't happen year round because I, Russia was far enough away. They didn't have land near warm water ports. So this becomes one of Peter the Great's focuses, acquire warm water ports. Well, he also recognizes that the first thing he has to do is be able to get Russia into some semblance of modernity. So he embarks on his great embassy from 1697 to 98. He visits the West, ostensibly to build alliances against the Ottoman Turk, but really to learn Western customs. And he learns techniques of building and manufacturing in the West. He's building ships. There's a, a statue here of Peter the Great building a boat in Holland. Um, now, he's traveling incognito. Here's the thing. Peter the Great is a ruler. He's used to being served. He's also six foot eight. He's a giant. And so he's trying to pass himself off because he's a hands-on guy. He wants to learn how to make a ship himself. He wants to learn how to cast cannon. So people played along with the fact that this Russian guy, want, this Russian monarch, wants to learn all this stuff. And his goal was to westernize Russia so that it could become an equal to the West. Now, he brings the Eastern Orthodox Church under state control. He imposes high taxes on the peasants to pay for his westernization because, frankly, most of the nobility didn't pay taxes. They were exempted from taxation. He increased the size of the army and trained it in the modern European style. He hired mercenaries from the West to come to Russia to train his troops, to educate them in the finest, most modern ways of fighting. And he reduced the powers of the boyar, the nobility. Hmm. Does that sound familiar to any centralizing states that we've talked to up to this point? Part of his westernization was a direct attack on the boyar's appearances and privileges. Uh, interestingly enough, it's at this time that he introduces the potato to Russia, which fuels a population boom. Uh, he establishes a table of ranks, this, this system within Russia where uh, the bureaucracy is based on merit and not birth. He gets rid of these noblemen who are in place uh, because their parents were in, in these places, in these offices, and instead puts in talented peasants. And he just goes about lessening the control of the boyars. This is an image here of Peter dressed in Western European style cutting the beards off a boyar um, who's dressed in the traditional Russian style, but much more medieval style, I think you'd agree. Uh, he establishes a beard tax, all directed towards modernizing Russia. And he orders boyars to wear clothes in the Western fashion. If that's not an, a, a, an autocratic dictator telling people what clothes they can wear and how they can wear their facial hair, I don't know what is. Now, Peter is successful. Uh, he fights a 21-year-long war to acquire a port city against the Swedes, and he does so. It's now called St. Petersburg. Uh, his, and again, his old capital was Moscow, was landlocked, so he moves the entire court to St. Petersburg. Uh, tens of thousands of people die building this capital, but Peter the Great wanted it, and so it was done. And then he orders the boyars to move there as well. Now he dies in 1725 with no children, and his wife becomes empress, which sets a precedent for future female rulers of Russia. And he is an autocrat. And the Russian czars are the most powerful uh, autocrats, most powerful monarchs in Europe until 1906. So I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. See ya.